Welcome to Thought Leadership for the New Normal, a conversation series with Sacred Heart University deans. This week we ask our guests, how will this crisis impact home health care, rehabilitation, and elder care? Join us now live from the campus of Sacred Heart University with your host, Randy Kay. Hello, I am Randy Kay from WSHU and Sacred Heart University, and I welcome you to this conversation with uh, Sacred Heart University deans and other experts on important topics. I want to welcome our guest today. We'll be talking about home health care and elder care rehabilitation. Our first guest is the Dean of the College of Health Professions here at Sacred Heart. Welcome to Maura Everson. And then we had the mm -hmm. owner and co-founder of Professional Care Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation PC. They have locations in each East Patchogue and Riverhead, New York. Welcome to George Cerisi. Welcome, George. And Jessica Dunn. And Jessica is a board-certified geriatric clinical specialist, also clinical director of Genesis Rehab Services. Welcome, everybody. Now, I have a bunch of questions to ask you. You know, I recently had a call from an elderly neighbor across the street, and she seems to be doing okay, and we're all looking out for our neighbors. And I asked her how she's doing, and she shared with me that she's really scared that she was planning to sell her home and move into an assisted living, but she's had several friends who passed away from COVID, and now she's going to have home health care. And, you know, I find myself wondering on a personal basis what that means for her and also for the people who will provide that sort of care, either in facilities or at home. So Dean Eberson will, will begin with a conversation uh, for you, a question for you, and uh, George and uh, Jessica, you feel free to chime in with any of these questions if you wish, but I have definitely questions directed for each of you. So Dean Iverson, how has the pandemic impacted uh, education for health professionals the way we've delivered it? Uh, it's impacted in a variety of ways. Uh, first of all, as you know, when the pandemic hit, we had to close down our on-site clinical skills training. As a result of that, we needed to uh, identify new modes of delivery of education as well as innovative ways of providing instruction via technology for our students. Um, we ended up doing a fair no amount of videoing of clients and luckily Sacred Heart has a very robust technology setup. And so we were able to rely on some resources that currently existed in order to augment our teaching instruction. Another piece was that during this period of time, a number of the health professions were actually not reimbursed for telehealth. And so that was not a component that was an integral part of their academic education. However, as the government realized the need for care delivery in the home, um, the policies actually changed with reimbursement. And as a result, we needed quickly to ramp up and get involved in the best ways of care delivery via telehealth. Obviously, there are things that can't be anticipated. For example, we've had um, one of our alums who's an occupational therapist who moved to telehealth when it became approved by the government, trying to work with families and children within the home. This particular woman, Julia Chapetta, uh, actually works with young elementary school children. And not every home has IT resources. Not every home has uh, materials that you need in order to provide care. There are also language translation issues that came into play. So finding online learning platforms um, like Bloom's Learning took a while for the therapist to kind of scale up, adapt those, and then implement them in the home. The other is many family members were not as comfortable or not knowledgeable about what the child was doing at school during the day. And so that was a big transition. Um, for our elders, as you mentioned, you know there was a lot of fear about receiving care um, in institutions. And so what happened was a lot of um, elective surgeries were postponed um, or those that would have normally gone to a rehab setting actually came home. And so the acuity level of patients was very, very high. And uh, many of the home care institutions, for example, developed a COVID kit. So a kit that was for family members, as well as a kit that was available for the health care providers going into the home. Um, but even just donning and doffing, meaning taking on and off your PPE, is different in a home setting. You're doing it in the garage. You're doing it out in a hallway. 
you're doing it in many different areas where it's not the same as a hospital that has a, a more natural setup for that. So a number of home health agencies set up buddy systems to mentor people and provide feedback on proper donning and doffing. Leaving a, a PPE kit in the home was another way of ensuring that there was safety both for the elder at home and for their caregivers. And I think the, one of the main differences with this pandemic is oftentimes those individuals in the home that could help the therapist with care could have been sick as well. And so now you have people needing to isolate and not being able to join in and help out. And I'm sure my colleagues will have some other thoughts about this, but those are my initial reactions. COVID kit, that's P PPE basically? Is that what you yes. mean? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Well, you know, George, you are out in the field all the time. So uh, by chiming in, let me add this question. Can you take us kind of like through a timeline? What a year it's been of the events from early 2020 until now. And we've all had to make adjustments along the way. How have you had to adjust your business and your practice as these events unfolded? Yeah, I tell you, it's been a roller coaster of a ride for the last several months, to say the least. Um, as you mentioned, I own an outpatient orthopedic and sports physical therapy and occupational therapy practice out here on Long Island. Uh, we have locations in Patchog, which is on the South Shore, and in Riverhead, which is a little further out east. But nonetheless, still pretty close to New York City, which, as we all know, was you know the original epicenter of the COVID crisis. Um, <clears throat> but to answer your question, you know, I probably first started monitoring the virus probably back in early January. And I did it for two reasons. One, from a business perspective, but also from a personal perspective. Uh, my family and I were planning a cruise that was going to be leaving out of New York to go to um, <clears throat> down to the Caribbean in March. So, you know, my wife and I were a little hesitant to start, but we made the decision that if the first reported case were to um, come to New York, we would definitely cancel the trip. And sure enough, March 1st, the first reported case came to New York. We canceled the trip. And that's when my partner, Jim, and I really sat down and started uh, developing and implementing a plan for the practice um, in terms of safety, but also logistically in preparation for the worst case scenario. And ironically, as we all know, the worst case scenario happened. Um, <clears throat> so initially, it was simple. It was things like just implementing you know, more sanitary processes, um, continuously monitoring the CDC and the state health department, which honestly was changing every single day. Um, I think it was mid-March, we first had our first staff meeting and, you know, we started the meeting off by telling the staff that we allowed and encouraged any staff member who is not comfortable coming to work to work from home if feasible, um, to use their paid time off or just to simply take a leave of absence. You know, we really didn't want anyone coming to work that wasn't comfortable coming to work. And at that time, three of our 19 therapists chose that option, which was completely fine. Uh, another thing, you know, we discussed was it was our goal not to lay anybody off at that time. And one of the things I'm really most proud of is, you know, we came together as a team and decided that um, we're not going to lay people off. But if we have to, we'll all decrease our hours accordingly to meet the patient demand. Um, another thing that we discussed was, is PT really essential? Um, you know, some of us thought it was essential. Some of us thought maybe it wasn't essential. And it took a few days to get clarification from the governor's office um, with the help of the private practice section of the APTA to find out the we were classified as an essential uh, group of people. And then lastly, like Dean Everson was saying, you know, we were exploring, exploring telehealth options. In New York at that time, telehealth wasn't an option, but there were rumors that that was going to change and that some insurance companies were going to follow suit. I think it was late March when the first patient gave us a call and said that they tested positive, which created a logistical nightmare for staffing. Because back then, we as clinicians were wearing face masks, N95 masks, but the patients weren't. So as per the CDC, we then had to quarantine any staff member that was in a close proximity to the patient that tested positive. Um, so it was, I almost felt like a hockey coach at one point where, you know, two or three therapists would go into quarantine and two or three therapists would come back. Um, unfortunately, at that point, probably in early April, our caseload decreased to about 50% of the pre-COVID level. Um, and unfortunately, at that point, we had to make the tough decision to start laying people off. Um, fortunately, that was right after the federal government announced that they would add the extra $600 per week in, you know, unemployment benefits. Um, 
we continued a downward spiral to probably about mid-April. We hit rock bottom. We were about 25% capacity. And just to put it in perspective, you know, we used to see almost 1,400 patient visits per week, and we were down to about 350. We went from 70 uh, employees down to about 25. Um, and not to mention this whole time, and this could be a whole other conversation, we were navigating the whole PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program um, situation, which was a whole, you know, whole other nightmare. Um, then I'd say May, we pretty much weathered the storm. We were at rock bottom for a good month. Um, we came up to June in New York in my region. Elective surgeries were allowed to begin again in June 6th. Shortly thereafter, we saw an increase in referrals. And that brings us to this week. We're currently at about 65% of where we were previously. We're up to about 40 employees. And our goal has you know, remained unchanged of really trying to get everyone back as soon as possible. So, yeah, it's, it's been a roller coaster, to say, to say the least. <laughs> wow. Thank you. And if if anybody is watching in an area outside of where we are, again, we are located in Connecticut and Long Island in New York. And so at the moment, our numbers are pretty good. And so things are coming back, but it may be a very different story in other areas of the country and of the world, of course. In what ways, let's talk about the delivery of home health care. Uh, how has the pandemic changed the way home care is delivered? Uh, well, I think one of the things that has been um, very important and critical for protection of patients is the fact that many home health agencies developed a COVID team. So there were a group of individuals that trained together, developed their competencies together, or as I said, around donning and doffing, PPE, but also thinking about like transitioning or, or transmitting infection from home to home. So using shoe coverings, which you normally wouldn't do. Um, I think that it, it has positive effects in the sense that care providers in the home, nursing, PT, OT, speech, have really come together as a group. I think they have a better understanding of their skills and contributions to home care, so that's quite good. Um, acuity really is quite high for those patients that do come home that have been infected with COVID. It's not just typical deconditioning. They are really quite weak when they're coming back to the home. So the amount of care that they need is quite significant. Uh, in talking with one of our alums um, most recently who is involved in home care delivery, uh, particularly with the elderly, you know, one of the big concerns with home care is, is a patient too sick to come home and receive home care? And in some of those instances, uh, the patient has been able to stay at home, but first to have 24 our care around the clock and then have rehab services come in. So care delivery in the home 24 seven and then rehab coming to augment it has been the way that patients have been able to stay at home, particularly those that are worried about going into rehab or skilled facilities. Um, I think another um, major aspect of this is recognizing that with this particular disease, it's a very complex disease. As George had mentioned, you know, when we began, we had an understanding of a, a constellation of, of symptoms that were relatively small. And as we learned more about the disease, the uh, case definition or the way that we describe the symptoms of a disease really evolved. And so it's something that therapists and care providers need to stay abreast of on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that's... Um, something that we need to keep in mind moving forward, that things will always be changing and it's important to always be monitoring what's going on from the CDC and how the state and other agencies are helping provide recommendations for care. Thank you. I think ever-changing. Many people have described it as whack-a-mole. Uh, it's just <laughs> an, an ever-morphing situation. Uh, George, can you chime in on that at all? Because I will be asking you about new procedures, but uh, anything to add to this conversation with what Dean Everson just said? Yeah, I, I think she nailed it. It's ever-changing. It really is. And, you know, I, I speak to a lot of colleagues in the field, you know, down in Florida, um, you know, up in Massachusetts, and, you know, we're kind of all sharing information, which is which is great, um, but it's ever changing. You know, if you remember in the beginning, the CDC was, you know, only encouraging healthcare providers to wear masks and not the general public. Um, so I think you have to stay dialed in to what's going on, the change in symptoms. They've added a few new symptoms of, of the disease, as Dr. Everson just mentioned. 
Um, so yeah, there's a lot of great resources. New York State for us, where I live, uh, Department of Health. Um, even you know another great res- resource we had out here in Suffolk County was the um, Suffolk County Office of Emergency Management, which was instrumental in us getting a lot of that PPP early on where we couldn't find it. And um, you know that was something that really helped us out in the beginning, being able to give patients the masks, um, you know, which they didn't have when they first were coming into our office. Okay, thank you. While I have you, are there new procedures that you have added to your practice? Because we want to improve the safety of the patients, we want to improve the safety of the staff, and we keep learning more and more. Any new procedures that you've added? Yeah, there there might be one or two that we've added. (laughs) Um, No, but seriously, yes, we've added a lot. You know, I had the conversation with the staff and continue to have the conversation with our staff about safety, number one. And optics, Um, it's important that we have to be safe, but we also have to look safe. We want patients to feel comfortable coming into our office knowing that we're taking all the precautions. Um, And whether that means wiping down treatment tables between every use, even if it has to be done twice as the patient walks back so they know that the the equipment was wiped down. Um, we We allocate one physical therapy aid four times a day to go through the whole entire office and clean everything, every door handle, the front desk, the waiting room, um, every piece of equipment. Um, you know, we actually instituted right in the beginning, uh, we performed temporal scanning thermometer checks on every patient and staff as they entered the building. And what I find interesting is that we probably did about 10,000 temperature checks. And would you believe not one person came to the office with a fever, which tells me that the general public really gets it and understands that if they're not feeling well, you know, they should be staying home and, and getting medical attention. Um, you know, even in the beginning, we had questionnaires about their travel history, educating them on their symptoms, um, asking patients to come alone or if, have, if they're driven to the office, have their driver wait in the car, um, separating treatment tables, you know, socially distancing. In our Patchog office, it's pretty easy. We have a pretty large office. It's about 7,000 square feet. But in our Riverhead office, it's significantly smaller. So we had to adjust the schedule to allow less people in the office at the same time. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, prior to mask being mandated um, through the help of the Suffolk County Office of Emergency Management, um, we were able to get a lot of the PPE to give to the patients as they would come in, which really was a game changer. Um, like I mentioned earlier, because um, if a patient was wearing a mask and a therapist was wearing a mask, and if unfortunately the patient tested positive, the therapist then would not have to be quarantined. It would be categorized as a low risk category. Um, so that really that really was a game changer in allocating staff. Um, of course, things like providing protective eye equipment for the, the clinical staff and doing what I think physical therapists do best, really simply educating our patients on the symptoms, the risks, the safety precautions that they can take, which in turn will keep us safe, it'll keep them safe, and it'll keep the rest of our patients safe. Um, Two more things that we're doing right now, we're exploring uh, weekly COVID testing for the staff, which will keep us ahead of the curve in case somebody does, you know, test positive. Um, And also we're creating an outdoor exercise space for our fitness and athletic performance clients. Um, Because right now in New York, um, technically today was the start of phase four, but gyms aren't allowed to open um, unless they're outside. So um, we're actually having that built as we speak. Um, So yeah, there's been a few things that we've done to try to uh, mitigate the risk. What do you think, everything changes, what do you think will be the new norm for home care? Let's talk about preparing the students. How can we best prepare our students to meet these new needs of home care? Well, um, one, of, one of the ways that we can certainly do that is by um, simulating the home care setting. So we at Sacred Heart actually have a home care suite. It is a, a typical apartment. There's no hospital bed. It's a regular bed, a regular wash shower, a functioning kitchen. And the students will now have an, op- have an opportunity to practice, for example, squeezing into a small hallway and trying to get their PPE on and off in the proper manner. We're having all of our students go through protocol and be trained before they can even walk on campus to come back to practice their clinical skills, which they began back in June 8th under phase 1B in Connecticut. Um, I also think we, we are spending a lot of time and effort exploring the different telehealth um, platforms, both for 
younger children at home as well as for individuals at home that are older adults or uh, middle schoolers. Um, certainly there are two of our speech therapists that have identified some really significant issues when you're working with children that have stuttering. How do you help to communicate with them when you're working in telehealth is really challenging. And so it has really opened a lot of interesting ways for us to explore how to communicate with people with different abilities. Communicating online as we know or through video, which I thought was really fun in the beginning. I'm not really feeling that after a while. Um, has certainly, it changes the way that you communicate. It's a, you need to be a lot more creative when you're working through telehealth with um, your clients to create things that are A, available in their home, B, are engaging and keep individuals engaged. You know, you're working with a middle schooler, suddenly now mom and dad need to be there and be present, which not all middle schoolers are very thrilled about. And so how do you keep communication channels running? Um, one way to do that, for example, is physical therapy or occupational therapy to ask the parents to video the child doing the skill that you want them to do and then to share that video with you. So you're kind of calling back in and communicating with the parent about how that individual is performing the exercise and giving feedback. So in some ways, it, it's great because with parents and children, it's a great way for them to um, interact and for the parent to see how much a child can and can't do. But in that sort of middle school age where parents are less cool and not fun to be around, it's not, it, you have to find a way to keep a child motivated and be engaged. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're all finding workarounds. And in general, in a lot of these conversations, we find that we are gaining a new respect, respect for things like telehealth and online learning and some of the things that maybe we didn't trust so much before, but now we've had to trust them and we're discovering some really good new ways to learn and interact and diagnose and treat. But we all know there are certain things that cannot be done online. And so it's interesting to see home health care, not just elder care, but children and others that need rehab at home, how it is changing with regard to that. So I think that we are working on getting Jessica to come through on a, on a cell phone, talk about workarounds. But meantime, <laughs> let me go back to you, George, and talk about some of the challenges and the obstacles that continue to be present as we all try to move forward. You're rebuilding your practice as you shared before. When do you think, hard to tell, I know, an ever-changing situation, when do you think you might rebuild to a somewhat, I say normal level, let's say the previous level with these workarounds or without? Do you have a time frame? And what are the challenges or obstacles that you're facing as we work toward that? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of variables in that equation. Number one being, will there be a second wave? Um, and if so, how will that affect our ability to get the rest of our employees off unemployment, which, like I said before, is really our number one goal right now? Um, can we get all of them back? Uh, my concern is that there still go is going to be a percentage of patients who do not feel safe or simply don't want to come into a public space like a PT office, um, and that might limit our ability to get back to 100%. Um, my goal right now is if we can get back to about 80 or 85% by the fall, I think I'd be happy. Um, and as crazy as it might sound, I think it might be a solid year. I think it might be next February or March, and maybe that'll coincide with possibly a vaccine before we get back to 100%. Um, but there's a lot of unanswered questions. Um, what is this going to mean for the region, for other PT offices? What effect is this going to have on the job market? I think of a lot of new grads that just graduated that are looking for a job that are going to be competing with very other, very capable other, maybe more experienced candidates. Um, that's probably only going to drive the salary request down, which I don't think is good for our profession. Um, will other PT offices decide to work more efficiently? And what I mean by that is, are they going to hire less staff, both clinically and administratively? You know, what effect is that going to have on patient care? Um, obviously, higher unemployment numbers means less people are going to have health insurance. There's going to be more people with less disposable income that you know may question the value of that high copayment for PT two or three times a week. Um, like we talked about before, is telehealth going to be allowed going forward in New York? Um, 
you know, right now it's allowed. And is it even a viable option? Is that something that we want to pursue um, for patients and, and for the business? Um, people that know me, I, I'm the most optimistic person. Um, so I think it's important to stay positive and focus what's on important. And right now what's important is staying healthy. Um, I know my staff, we're, we're ready to work and overcome any challenge that lies ahead. And I'm confident that, that we can do that. So much. So now we are uh, going to attempt to talk to you, Jessica. I have a little cell phone right here, and um, hopefully it will work. Hello, we see you. So um, I had some questions for you. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfect, Randy. All right, good. All right, we have a thumbs up here. So can you, first of all, I, I hope you've been, I know you've been dealing with um, these technical issues, but I think you've been hearing some of your colleagues' answers to the questions. Let me ask you how this pandemic has impacted the therapist's, therapist's perception of, let's say, telehealth and the post-acute environment. Well, yes. <laughs> I'll try to answer the question, so hopefully you can all you can all hear me. Now I apologize for the technical challenges that we're having today, which is one of the things that as therapists we are really readily having to work through when we are using telehealth. Um, but really, the pandemic has really changed the landscape and has allowed us um, a huge opportunity to readily use telehealth much more than we were in the past. And I actually have the privilege to be a delegate for the state of New Jersey for um, the APTA House of Delegates. And back in 2019, um, our, our sister state, New York, the New York delegation actually um, actually created an RC for the House of Delegates. It was RC 41 that charged the APTA to develop best practice strategies to guide the use of telehealth in physical therapist practice. And it was really interesting because when this RC was introduced just in 2019, so less, you know, really less than a year ago, the conversation around telehealth was really focused more related to ethics and it was related to, you know, as a profession, would we, would we be able to offer the same level of standard of practice if we uh, provided services via this mode. And so the conversation really um, was really focused on the barriers rather than increasing access to services or how telehealth may be an adjunctive service to enhance the efficacy of our services. And, and then the pandemic happened, right? So the Northeast was really impacted very badly. And very quickly, within a few weeks, we saw centers that were COVID naive were now COVID positive. We were really struggling with um, not only a number of patients being COVID positive, but our staff. So many of our staff were now positive. And we really were having to, to look at resource management very differently, our provision of care very differently. And we really had to very quickly, you know, figure out how are we gonna service our patients and make sure that they don't continue to decline or develop other secondary impairments related to social isolation and or um, you know physical inactivity if if we don't stay involved. And so you know many the conversation switched really there. So really March into April we saw the conversation among rehab professionals changed to from barriers to really opportunities and how this mode was really necessary to provide older adults um, therapy services in the post-acute setting. And then um, as, as Dr. Everson and um, my other colleague George had mentioned that really we had some other barriers related to reimbursement um, and Medicare came out with waiver 1135, which in March didn't necessarily include therapy professionals in the post-acute setting, but on April 30th, another additional provision did. And so at a federal level, it really um, said for Medicare that therapy professionals would be reimbursed uh, for providing telehealth services, which was a huge opportunity for, for many of us and for access to care and for our patients. Now, that was just one, one provision. So when we talk about telehealth, there's lots of 
there's lots of rules that we need to follow. So in addition to federal guidelines, there's also state practice act guidelines related to telehealth. And there's a lot of states that right now, while they are functioning in in a public um, health emergency, have also included therapy professionals as part of their team to provide services to older adults, which is a very powerful thing. And then we also have reimbursement and payer guidelines. So I think that Beyond the perception of therapists, which has really changed in a much more positive light, I think as as a country, um, people are really starting to understand how this mode can really um, impact people's access to care as well as the level of services that they're receiving. So I, I think this has been a huge change for us in a very positive direction. Thank you. I mean, it's certainly been a crash course for so many of us in in so many things. And and although some of us are taking a breath, we're all pretty much still in crisis mode. And as George was saying, it might take a full year for things to settle in. And then maybe another year after that for us to see how the dust settles and what impact it has had, both positive and negative, on on the job market, on the training that we receive, on, on new modes of care that we discover work, and how to combine those. We've got a whole lot of things ahead, but while I have you and we can hear you, uh, how do you think this is going to impact? And of course, um, George and Dr. Everson, feel free to chime in on any of these things in reaction, but how do you think this will impact uh, how rehab professionals and medical professionals will be trained? What factors do you think, (laughs) we're still learning, obviously, that will have to be considered? Yeah, I think that's a great, great question, Randy. And so in my role with Genesis Rehab, is um, part of my title is University Relations Director. And I've been in this role since 2009. And so part of my role is to really support our student programs. So not just physical therapy, but occupational therapy and speech language pathology uh, training, uh, graduate level training in the post-acute environment. And I cover a very large geography. And so, you know, I have the opportunity to work with a number of programs and, you know, a number of students and certainly on the forefront of many, of many individuals, so many universities, as well as therapists is, you know, um, how are we going to allow students back into our centers Um, and that's a really important piece because we need to make sure that we're training the next generation and the next group of professionals on how to work with um, the older adult geriatric population we need to ensure that they have the skills that they need to service this population and so right now obviously because of infection control um, and infection um, related um, thoughts that we are not allowing students in the centers. They're considered non-essential um, volunteers and or, or personnel. And so until actually the nursing home is in phase three of the recovery, um, we're not really supposed to have students back into the center. And so we are looking at a number of factors related to this. So we're looking at state testing requirements, we're looking at the phase of reopening that each state is in. We're having to consider not just um, you know federal guidelines, state guidelines, but down to the municipality and local local um, you know authority guidelines related to certain geographies, as well as looking at community spread. We're looking at. Um, quarantine certain states have state quarantine guidelines so if you're traveling out of state and you're entering into a state and you're from somewhere else though there are certain guidelines related to quarantining for 14 days before you're really supposed to be out and about within that state and so we're looking at a number of these factors in addition to to students um, directly we're looking at you know ppe the use of ppe how having students in another person in the center um, and using PPE will, might impact, um, you know, our supplies, as well as making sure that students have the proper training to don PPE, doff PPE, and that they also have additional education and um, training and support related to COVID. Because as um, we mentioned before, this is not just a respiratory um, virus. This virus impacts you know, our endothelial cells, it impacts the heart, it impacts many different organs. And so we want to make sure that our students entering into um, our centers are really um, prepared 
that they feel comfortable and that they know really what to do as far as from an infection control and emergency procedures. And so these are all things that we're really readily um, looking at and really anxious to work through because we recognize how important it is to train um, train our therapy professionals. Thank you so much. Mind I mind me joining in, Randy. Um, oh, go ahead, in, yes. Yep, in parallel to that, as, as I mentioned, um, all the points Jessica makes are very solid. Um, we at Sacred Heart, we actually opened under phase 1B following all of those guidelines for the state as well as the CDC recommendations. So all of our students spend about eight hours in COVID training. That means uh, understanding the full pathophysiology of the disease, infection control, practicing donning and doffing PPE before they even walk in the building. We, were, we are um, having all of our students, when they do their clinical skills, they wear a mask as well as a face shield because obviously touching a patient, you can't be six feet apart. So social distancing can appear when you're trying to draw blood, when you're trying to uh, take a blood pressure, when you're trying to manipulate a spine. Um, so in one way, our health profession students are really like the leaders among the university student group because they understand fully at this point how important uh, safety and uh, of um, abiding by the guidelines, wearing PPE, and understanding proper hand washing technique. They understand that so much more than perhaps a student studying history or English. And they really are living in the moment right now. So my students have been on campus since June 8th, and they are continuing to practice all of their skills. We're even making a little pioneer promise, which is Sacred Heart has pioneers. Um, so these students are making a pledge to protect one another and their community. And I think this, it will develop a sense of camaraderie, but our clinical ed team working together with individuals like Jessica can help to ensure that these students are really probably better trained than I was as a student with respect to PPE and understanding universal precautions. And I think that that is something that's really important that will help us to work through those complex things of some of our students are in Connecticut, but I'm from Massachusetts and are going to Mass or maybe going, they won't be going to Arizona, that's a little bit of a hot spot right now, but to other areas in the state, but they're well versed and well prepared before they walk out the door. And I think that many health professions, colleges and the country are embracing those same strategies and want to ensure and reinforce with our clinical colleagues that our students are prepared and ready to protect you, your clients, and the community at large. That's wonderful, thank you. And you know, it brings to mind that we've been so caught up in the contagion of the disease and we're still learning about the effects of the disease. So that's a, another thing. And uh, thinking, uh, Dean Everson, about Sacred Heart students who may not come from Connecticut, who may be trained here and then go home to a state like Florida or Arizona where they're going to use their skills in an even more intense environment. Uh, George, anything to add on this topic? Because the next question I have for really all three of you is what you think the new normal might look like. Uh, George, anything to add on this question? Or you can just start with the new normal I, I actually question. had a question for, for Jessica, because she obviously seems to be the expert more so than me on telehealth. Um, do you think from a reimbursement standpoint that telehealth is here to stay? Do you, do you see the insurance companies following suit for good? Or you think they're going to back off once this pandemic is over? Was that a question for me, George? It is. Okay. Yes. Okay. I thought I heard it. <laughs> so, you know, well, I might be able to better answer your, your question on July 27th, but um, because right now, um, the national uh, emergency right now is through July 26th. So we're really readily anticipating that, excuse me, that CMS is going to make some big decisions about telehealth, but it does look like um, a Ver Burma, uh, Verma, um, Seema Verma, who is the administrator for CMS, is very much on board with extending these waivers beyond the, the national um, national uh, public emergency. So I have a feeling we're going to see this to stay. Um, you know, I think I know that um, 35 centers, senators this week wrote a letter to Congress um, really advocating for telehealth and really um, advocating and to push us moving forward because um, 
this has definitely opened the door for, for us as providers, as healthcare professionals and providers. And I think people are really recognizing how much we can really support public health initiatives as well as prevent debility and um, have a big, big impact on patients' recovery and mortality rates. So I think I think this is going to be the door. This is the, the door to keep us on this trajectory forward. So um, maybe talk to me on, on, on uh, July 27th and we'll see if I <laughs> might be right. I don't Thank know. We'll a reminder, by the way, if you're watching us live right now, that you are welcome to post your own questions in the comments box, and uh, we might have a chance to get to it. And thank you for watching. You can always view it later as well. My final question is for all of you, uh, but I'll start with you, Jessica, since I have the cell phone up to the microphone. What do you think the new normal might might be in rehab? Well, take a I guess. That's a big question, <laughs> but I think that I, I think that what this has definitely taught us um, is that we do need to be much more mindful about our infection control protocols. And I think that um, beyond just COVID, I think that particularly in the inpatient post-acute sector, what what I've at least observed is that. We, as we moved through this pandemic, we got much better about quarantining individuals, about you know monitoring people, um, um, patients' vital sign responses and and health status, and that we really um, got better about um, our infection control protocols within the center and adhering to those protocols, and really um, quickly. Um, we saw centers that in the beginning of the pandemic it was very difficult to. Um, control the spread of COVID by, by really April, we were able to quarantine units off and we really were able to localize that, uh, the virus into a certain group of patients and we're much better about um, the management of that. And that has a lot to do with testing, obviously, I think. Um, so I think that that really has set the stage for um, really better infection control protocols related to other types of um you know, organisms like VRE and MRSA and staff. And I, I think I would hope that um, we're going to, those protocols are going to be here to stay for, for quite some time. I think that's the biggest impact as far as the new normal that I see um, related to that and, P and PPE. Thank you, Jessica. George, I'll bring it to you. What does the new normal look like for you? Yeah, I tend to agree. I think we've learned a lot out of this whole pandemic from infection control, number one, but also you know, how to run a business, making sure that you have funds that are allocated in case of emergencies. Um, like I said before, I'm a pretty optimistic person and I learned a lot personally. I learned a lot from my employees. You know, you see the sacrifice that a lot of people made and you remember what brings us together is, you know, our love for one another's love for one another and the ability to work well as a team. And I think it just gives me the strength to know that we can overcome anything and whatever the new normal is, I, I think we can hit it head on and, and overcome it. I would just add Le to that. Um, Go ahead. Yes, I was, I was just going to get to you. Oh, well, that's all right. Um, thank you, Randy. One thing that I think is has been an essential part of particularly physical therapy, but many of the health professions is this um, importance of health promotion, not just disease prevention. And what COVID has shown us is that these patients are highly deconditioned, much more so than we anticipate for somebody that has typically a respiratory illness. And we know that it has now moved into the cardiovascular system, as just said, with um, the involvement of the epithelial lining. But we, have, we see su such rampant changes across our country with respect to COVID. Younger kids having higher levels of obesity than we had in the past before as a direct result of lack of activity, not going to school. Um, we also see the mental health impact of people being isolated, uh, both for the individual and for the family members that are ha experiencing that loss of not being able to engage with their loved ones. And so I think that care delivery is going to really look at a comprehensive holistic view of the human of, of individuals from mental health to health promotion, as well as to re rehabilitation. And the, that full spectrum of care shows us as a group of health professions that we truly are essential. 
So in my mind, you know, the initial debate about are we essential or not and are, should students be coming back into the clinic, I think we're going to have a, a population in the U.S. that is much more deconditioned from being quarantined, uh, from being isolated, from becoming depressed about being isolated. And we really will need to have this population of workers out in the workforce, but in a broader scope than we've seen in the past. Thank you so much. So I think that brings us to an end. I want to thank all my guests for joining me today. I really appreciate it. I'm Randy Kay from WSHU and Sacred Heart University. We have another topic and another episode coming on July 15th, and I certainly hope that you will join us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. Thank you.